In our previous video, we introduced ourselves to the syntax of sentential logic. And beyond just learning what letters and connectives we're allowed to use, we learned official notation. And official notation is important because official notation generates well-formed formulas in sentential logic, and well-formed formulas are uh, meaningful sentences that we can confer and figure out truth and falsity on. And of course, this is important because this will allow us eventually to figure out validity of arguments. But it's not the case that everything needs to be an official notation. And what we're going to learn in this video is a way to just generate a well-formed symbolic sentence. So this isn't a well-formed formula, which is the most precise version that's official. This is sort of a more informal and relaxed style of notation that is still perfectly meaningful, but is a little easier to write. So here was the list of sentences that we looked at last time, and this is how we symbolize them in official notation. But immediately you should have sort of been suspicious and realized that a lot of the official notation rules aren't really necessary. So for example, for you can have fries or salad, why do I need the brackets around P or Q? Why can't I just have P or Q with no brackets? And the same for P arrow R. Nothing really changes for I don't like cats. For it's Saturday and we have logic, why is it brackets around the X and Y? Doesn't just X and Y on its own really mean the exact same thing and capture the meaning? Now finally, if, I have, if bikes and scooters are great, then Ada will buy one of each. It seems like I can probably remove some brackets from that too. So well-formed formulas actually add a lot of brackets, but are they all really necessary? So how do we convert this last statement into informal notation? That's actually sort of tricky. When we look at it, we realize that there's these major brackets around the outside, and those brackets around the outside belong to the conditional because they're actually containing the conditional. How do I know that? Well, actually, we're going to talk about that a lot more in this video. So if I peel off those external brackets, we get the following, bracket SNT, conditional, bracket R, and Z. So how do I know uh, that this is okay? Well, it seems to read the exact same way as the sentence above. Now the next meaningful question is, can I peel off additional brackets? Can I get SNT, arrow, R, and Z? Well, this is tricky, because I don't now know how to read this. Is this S and T, arrow, R, and Z? Or does this maybe say S and T, arrow, R, and Z? So I don't really know in this last form which is what we would call the main connective, the one that is really binding everything together. And so the danger when I move from the second one to the third is did I make this statement ambiguous? Is it possible that we could interpret it in a variety of different ways? And if so, that's a problem because what we want are precise statements that we can only interpret in one way. So what we're gonna consider are well-formed symbolic sentences and they have precisely the definition that I just said. They are a symbolic sentence that is well-formed, but doesn't have all the extra brackets in official notation. And the key feature of a well-formed symbolic sentence is that they are not ambiguous. There are not multiple ways of interpreting and understanding the statement. And so anything that's well-formed symbolic sentence, we're going to call informal notation. Here are the rules that we learned last time for official notation. And if you put a symbolic sentence into official notation, you've got a well-formed formula. These are the rules for informal notation. Now what you're going to see is they're essentially a relaxed version of the official notation rules. So instead of using parentheses around all of your binary connectives, you just use parentheses around some of the binary connectives. And you still never use brackets around a unary connective or atomic sentence like P on its own. We never do that. But we have to worry about those cases when we have this potential ambiguous nature. So to resolve the ambiguity, we adopt two conventions. The first convention is that we need to apply a hierarchy of connectives to disambiguate. And the second is that if you have a string of ands in a row, or a string of ors in a row, but not a mixture of them, they have to be all ands or all ors, we would use the rightmost rule to disambiguate. Okay, so what are these conventions? What are points three and four? We're gonna take a look right now. The hierarchy of connectives essentially is a standard way that we would read a symbolic sentence so that we can drop a bunch of brackets and just know. 
So here I've ordered the connectors from the strongest to the weakest, which means that whenever you see an arrow, it sort of dominates over whenever you have uh, hats and oars, ands and oars, and then everything else dominates over the negation or the tilde. Now sometimes you have connectives at the same level and we use parentheses to disambiguate. This is a little unclear and you might be wondering what's going on. So we can draw an analogy to uh, the English language. Let's pretend that the English language only has uh, three punctuation marks, the semicolon, the comma, and the period. If I gave you a paragraph with a bunch of words and those punctuation marks, you would actually know the hierarchy of connectives. If you have a bunch of words in a row, and let's say you have a comma, and then you have a semicolon, and then you have a period, and then you have more words, uh, you would know naturally that the most important, the strongest punctuation mark is the period. That's the one that actually cuts everything up first. And then within a sentence, let's say you had a comma and then a semicolon, which one of those punctuation marks carves up the sentence? Well, you actually know that's the semicolon. So everything before the semicolon is one chunk and everything after the semicolon is another chunk. And then within the first chunk, because I had the comma, that divides it into before the comma and after the comma up until the semicolon. So this is what a hierarchy of connectives is. It tells you where things stop and where things sort of override other connectives. Let's take a look at some examples of the difference between official and informal notation. So if I have bracket P or Q, this isn't a big deal. We already know that I can just symbolize this as P or Q without any parentheses or brackets on it. Now what about a more interesting example like this one? The question is how many brackets can I peel off? Now in informal notation, you don't have to peel off the maximum number of parentheses. You just have to remove some as you feel sort of are comfortable with basically. Now I will remove the maximum number just so we can talk about it. So here's an example. This is equivalent to P or bracket Q arrow P and R close bracket. Now you have to convince yourself that this is true. You have to really ask, how come I didn't leave the brackets or the parentheses up around P and R at the end? Now the reason why is if you just zero in on Q, arrow, P and R, I don't need the brackets around P and R because at that point I have an arrow and a hat of the and at the exact same level in the sense that they're interacting with each other. But we know from the hierarchy of connectives that the arrow is more important, that it's higher up, it's stronger than the and. So we know that the arrow is the main one. So I would read that as Q arrow P and R as opposed to Q arrow P and R. And that's because of the hierarchy of connectives. And once you see that, you realize that the informal notation on the right does match up with the official notation on the left. Here's another one, P and Q and R and S with lots of parentheses. Well, it turns out that I can peel them all off. Why? Because according to the right hand rule, if I have a string of ands in a row, I just get to select the rightmost one to be the main connective, and then I get to do it again and again. So this, these are perfectly equivalent. What about P arrow Q arrow R with parentheses? Well, you can say parentheses P arrow Q arrow R. Now you might ask, can I drop the brackets around the first P arrow Q and apply the right hand rule, the right most rule? Uh, and the answer is no. If you actually go back and look at the informal notation definition, the right most rule only applies to ands and ors. It does not apply to arrows or negations or anything like that. Okay, last one here. How do I convert this into informal notation? Well, if you actually take a look, you can't peel off many brackets at all. So I can peel off the outer parentheses because those outer parentheses are around the and, but I can't peel off into the inner ones because it's gonna change the meaning of the sentence. So this is worth going over by yourself, write out some other forms of this and really convince yourself uh, that, that, is, um, that that is the maximum number of parentheses you can peel off. Now finally, I have this example and can I peel off any brackets of this one? In fact, you can't. If you try and peel off any parentheses, you'll get something that means something different. I've been making use of three concepts that I haven't defined explicitly, and those are levels, main connective, and ambiguity. Ambiguity, we sort of understand, it's when you can interpret a sentence in a variety of ways. But what do I mean when I say connectives are at the same level? Or what do I mean by saying that's the main connective of a sentence? 
So these are really important concepts, and we've just been doing it implicitly by examples. So I'm going to rough them out a little bit more, but and then very soon we'll actually have a very precise definition of what these things are. Let's take a look at this sentence here. In this sentence, it's an official notation, and you can see that there's definitely some extra parentheses that I can remove. So when I remove the outer parentheses, uh, it still preserves the main connective. I know I haven't defined that yet, but if you look at the first example, the one in official notation, it's actually always nice and easy in official notation to see what the main connective is, the primary one, the one that ties everything together. Those outer parentheses essentially belong to the biconditional, the double arrow. And the reason why is because the brackets function as a way of stopping the reach of a connective. So for example, let's look at the negation parentheses P and Q. So if you look at the negation bracket uh, P and Q, the and is at a lower level than the negation. The reason why is because the parentheses are stopping the reach of the and. The and doesn't get to reach out and, and capture that negation because the parentheses stop it from doing that. So in that sense, the negation sort of dominates the inside because the negation is on a higher level. And so in the official notation form, you can see that the double arrow is the highest connective. But in the second informal form, we actually have an interesting problem. If you think about the level, we have the negation, the double arrow, which is the if and only if, and the or, all at the exact same level. E any of those three could actually be the main connective of the sentence. But this is where we apply our informal notation rules, and we realize that connectives at the same level can be disambiguated by applying the hierarchy of connectives. And the hierarchy says it's the arrows that are the do most dominant. So in this case, I have the biconditional, the if and only if, which is the double arrow. And even though it seems to be in conflict with the or or the negation, there is no ambiguity here. The main connective, the connective that binds everything together, is the biconditional, the double arrow, because of the hierarchy of connectives. Now, you have to be careful because you can never change the meaning of the sentence when you're trying to go from official to informal notation or when you're just trying to peel off more brackets to go even more informal. So here, what I did in this third example was I took off those parentheses on the negation P and Q. But I hope you see the difference now. Now, the negation in, and the and and the biconditional and the or, they're all on the same level. But the lowest connective, the weakest one, is the negation. So that means that the negation cannot reach beyond the P, and now the negation is only modifying the P itself. And so this does not have the same meaning. Finally, as another example, let's pretend that I leave the parentheses on the P and Q, but instead I remove the parentheses off the S and T. Is this one okay? Well, it still captures the main connective correctly, the double arrow, the if and only if biconditional. That is still the main connective due to the hierarchy of connectives. But the problem is, when I look at R or S and T, I don't actually know how to read that. I don't know if that's R or S and T, or is it R or S and T. And the thing is, those mean dramatically different things, so we need to be clear. Now you might think, hey, I can just apply the right hand rule and that will clear up the ambiguity. But it turns out that you can't. The right hand rule only works for consecutive of the same symbol. It's got to be all ands or it's all ors. This one is a combination of ands and ors, so this is actually ambiguous. So even though I preserved the main connective, the, the ambiguity is still there. Let's look at some bad examples, some not well-formed sentences, and this will also help us really come to grips with what it takes to be well-formed. So here's a simple example, negation, bracket, P. Now here the problem is that according to both official and informal notation, you can never have brackets or parentheses around an atomic sentence, so this is wrong. To fix this, we would just have to remove the parentheses and we're fine. This is another problem, bracket, negation, bracket, P and Q, close, close. The reason why this is a problem is because the parentheses are actually around the negation and we can't have parentheses around any unary connectives either. X and Y or Z, this is not well formed for the exact same reason that we saw on the previous slide. And that's because we cannot apply the right hand rule here. I don't know which is the main connective. What about this? 
s arrow t arrow v. Well, again, you might think this is okay. I can apply a right hand rule, but just a couple minutes ago, I mentioned that the right hand rule does not apply for consecutive arrows. It only applies for consecutive ands and consecutive ors. Finally, here's an example. What's wrong with this? Well, I want you to take a second and actually look at this because it's hard to find the mistake. Okay, so I hope you had some time to look. The mistake here is trivial. It turns out that there is one more open parentheses than there is close. And remember, you always need the same amount. Now you might think this is sort of annoying and trivial, but if you actually stare at a lot of logical symbols all the time, like I do, uh, these th sort of differences and mistakes really pop out at you. So you always need to make sure you have the right number of open brackets and close brackets. So this leads us to the actual full definition of what a main connective is. And again, the main connective definition here is technical. You don't need to know in the sense that have instant recall of the technical definition of main connective, but you really do need to know what a main connective is, is sort of fundamentally. So the definition says that every molecular sentence is one of the following five forms. Now this immediately follows from just our definition of how to generate well-formed formulas. And what it's really telling you is that the main connective is essentially the logical connective of the form above. So it's the connective that really dominates the sentence. It binds everything together. The main connective is fundamentally what the sentence is. So even if you have all sorts of connectives, it's the main connective that's how we would describe a, a statement, and the main connective is essentially the only connective that we care about when we're trying to evaluate properties of statements and arguments and so on. Let's do some examples. To find the main connective of this, I just have to ask questions about levels and questions about hierarchy. So here I have three possible answers for what my main connective is. It can be the or, the arrow, or the and. Now the problem with the arrow and the and is that they are bound within the parentheses there. So they're essentially at a lower level than the or. The arrow and the and cannot reach out to sort of capture and bind the P as well. So in this case, there's really only one option for what the main connective is. There's only one option for what ties everything together. So what is this? It's the or, so I would look at the statement and immediately say, this statement is an or statement. And it's true, it has other connectives in it, but it doesn't really matter. Notice that this statement is not ambiguous. Within the parentheses, the Q, arrow, P, and R, what is the main connective within those parentheses? Well, there, the arrow and the and are indeed at the same level, but we can apply the hierarchy of connectives, and we realize that the main connective within the parentheses is just the Here's another example, negation P double arrow Q and S arrow negation T. So remember how the levels works. Immediately the biconditional, the double arrow, as well as the arrow negation T, those ones cannot be the main connective because they are at a lower level due to the parentheses. So instead we only have two candidates here, the negation and the and, those are at the same level, they happen to be at the highest level. But due to the hierarchy of connectives, we know that it's the and that's the main connective and it can't be the negation because the negation is the weakest connective. S arrow negation Q or Z, what's the main connective here? Again, there's no parentheses, so everything is at the same level. So all three connectives are potential candidates to be the main connective. But once you apply the hierarchy of connectives, it's clear it must arrow. be the conditional because the conditional is at the top, it's the strongest connective. P and R and W, well, this one's not too complicated. We've talked about the right-hand rule quite a bit already, and we know when we have a string of consecutive ands or ors, it's the rightmost one, so that one is the main connective. Finally, what about this? Negation bracket P, biconditional, negation T or Z. Well, the biconditional, uh, I, I, I've actually kept saying that word. The biconditional is the phrase for the double arrow. I'm sorry if I had never mentioned that before. So the biconditional, negation, and the or, you can see they're all within the brackets there. Still, a lot of people will actually say the biconditional, the double arrow, is the main connective. And that's because a lot of people sort of naturally think that a negation cannot be the main connective, but that's not true. If you look at the statement, the biconditional cannot reach outside of those parentheses, it cannot reach the negation, so it's the negation that must be the main connective. It's the thing that modifies everything, and that's what this sentence is. 
You can see that I was actually doing some other sort of main connective skills, which is related to a technique called parsing in the previous slide. So parsing is where we just keep breaking down a sentence until we get to the very fundamental atomic parts. And this is a really handy skill when we're sort of beginning to look at this style of notation because you really want to be a pro at informal notation because almost everything in this course will be written informally. So here's an example of an informal sentence and we're going to parse it and identify the sub main connectives. So the first step is to find the main connective. Again, because of levels of a sentence, the only candidates we have are the biconditional and the negation, but we know that the biconditional, the double arrow, must be the main connective in this case. So we identify that main connective. But the way we parse this is because a biconditional is a, a binary connective, is that it has two parts. So we can immediately split the statement into two separate parts that are actually binded together by the biconditional. And so here we go. This is the split. And what we're going to continue is to find the sub main connectives, which is to say we're finding the main connectives of each part that the binary, that the biconditional joined together. Okay, so what's the main connective of P and Q arrow S? And what's the main connective of negation P or W? Take a second, think about it, and you should realize that it's the arrow and it's the negation on the other side. So what we're going to do is we're going to parse again. Now the arrow parses into two parts, and the reason why is because the arrow is a binary connective, it modifies two things. But the negation here only parses into a single part because a negation is a unary. So what I'm really asking is, what does the negation modify? Well, when you think about it, the negation must modify P or W. And what does the conditional modify, the arrow? On the one side, it's the P and Q, and on the other side, it's just the S. So we're going to keep going. We're going to identify the next set of main connectives, if there are any, and we will continue to parse. So what's the main connective of P and Q? That's easy. It's the arrow. Sorry, it's the... Uh, it's the hat, the and, and what's the main connective of P or W? It's the or, the wedge, and we parse again, and we get to P, Q, P, W. This is a very formal way of doing it, but really what we're just trying to do is be able to be good at seeing what the main connective is, and then figuring out what the sub-connectives are. And this is a really important skill moving forward. I can't stress this enough, identifying the main connective is essential. If you are unable to identify the main connective, you really can't move on beyond uh, this unit as everything relies and it just assumes that you can find main connectives and subconnectives as the course goes on. We've covered in this video informal notation, which means we now know what a well-formed symbolic sentence is. It's basically a more relaxed version of a woof, a well-formed formula. And so we've covered official notation and informal notation. What you need to know is that pretty much everything in this course, when you're asked to generate symbolic statements uh, or symbolic sentences, you will want to come up with something that is well formed in either informal or official notation. And that's really important. For the most part, even though there is advantages to official notation, like how it's actually quite easy to find out what the main connective is, you never have these conflicts of levels and so on, you will find yourself very quickly mastering and writing solely in informal notation. And that's really important because that's actually how most people write symbolic logic.